Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. In my previous video I promised to make a series of dolls inspired by Japanese mythology and tales. If the video got enough likes and it turns out it got way more support than I could have imagined. A big thank you to everyone for showing so much interest on the topic and supporting my art. Thanks to you this series was made possible. In this episode I will be covering a doll inspired by the legend of Peony Lantern. There are several versions of this story, but all of them talk about a ghost called Hone Onna or Bone Woman. Following from the name, her actual form is a skeleton, but men haunted by Hone Onna see her as a beautiful woman who visits them at night and drains their life energy through physical contact. In the legend of Peony Lantern, a girl who died of sickness comes as a Hone Onna during Obon festival. To visit the man she loved as she was still alive. They spent the first night together, but a curious neighbor witnessed the man embracing with a skeleton. In the morning he returns to warn his friend about him being haunted. Together they placed protective charms on the house. However, on the third night the man wasn't able to resist her and let her in. Next morning he was found dead, embracing with a skeleton. Sounds like a perfect project for Monster High Skeleta doll, who luckily to us happens to be a skeleton as well. I think I'll never stop admiring the detail Mattel used to put in their dolls in the past, not just in their outfits, but also body and face molds. And this Skeleta here is just a chef's kiss. Her face mold was also designed to resemble a human skull, but it was simplified so the doll could still have a face. But for this project I want her to be a legit skeleton. So I'm going to resculpt her face completely. In order to be able to apply any modifications I had to shrink her head in acetone using the slow shrinking method that Catmillion Studio shared with me. For this you need to put a doll's head in acetone solution, 9 parts of acetone and 1 part of water for 48 hours and then let it dry for another 48 hours. The head will become smaller and most importantly harder, so you can sand it, carve it, sculpt over it, do any modifications you want. In this particular project I am going to do all of these things. First I am going to remove the parts skulls don't have, like eyes, nose and lips, using my Dremel tool. Now it is time to smooth up all of the rough edges and add more details to the skull using epoxy sculpt. I used pictures of human skulls from the internet as reference, to get the shape as accurate as I could. I started with all of the little details and left the eye sockets until last, because I struggled to stick a boxy scalp from the inside. So I ended up performing a dangerous skull surgery on her. I couldn't cut hardened vinyl with a knife and had to use a saw attachment. Working with this tool gives me an anxiety level 100 because... Damn, I still need my fingers! <laughs> Luckily I was able to avoid the danger, the surgery was successful and now that I have access to the inside of her skull, I can sculpt the eye sockets. Now 
I glued the skull back together and used epoxy sculpt again to cover the cut and smooth up the holes from her hair on the scalp. Looking scary, <laughs> my first thought was to make her just as a skeleton wearing a wig, but when I looked at the skull I suddenly thought, hmm, after shrinking her head became pretty small, so after all why not, why wouldn't I try to fit the skull into a proper monster high head. So I took one of the biggest doll heads I had in stock and tried to carve something like a mask out of it. I used a Dremel to sand the edge to make the mask safe to use on the skull, tried it on and it fits perfectly. Another successful experiment. But the first things first, let's quickly paint the skull and leave the mask for later. Usually when I have to paint bones, the first color that comes to my mind is ivory, but this time I need to make the skin bone tone of her head match her body. And ivory looks a bit too yellow comparing to what the doll originally had. So I had to mix the color myself. I used white and brown acrylic paint in a shade called Van Dyke's Brown. From experience I learned that acrylic paint gets slightly darker as it dries, so I purposely mix it like one shade lighter than what I want to achieve and usually it works out well. I'm pretty happy with what I've got now and I'm going to blush the head and body with pastels anyway, so even if there's still some slight difference present, it won't be relevant for the end result. Just like with usual face-ups, I applied paint and blush in layers and I'm sealing it with matte Mr. Super Clear sealant from time to time.
Same goes for the body. First I cleaned it of dirt and oil with pure alcohol, primed it with MSC and applied the same pastels I used on her skull to add extra dimension and detail to the skeleton. When the scalp is so detailed already, blushing gets really easy. All you need is just add some shadows to highlight already existing features to make them look more realistic. I think the color match looks perfect. Now let's put them together and move on to the mask. While carving the mask out of the doll's head, I kept the top of her scalp to be able to make it not just a mask, but a wig also. At first I wanted to root her with black hair, but I barely had any left, so I switched to the white hair. And I think this change was for the best, because I think in the end it gave the doll much more individuality and character than I could have achieved with black hair. Another fun experiment I did in this project is the rooting method I chose. She has a removable scalp, so to me it was important to make it look good from the inside as well, and there was not so much room between the scalp and the skull for the protruding hair ends. So I decided to try another method where you fix hair bundles by wrapping every loop around the next one, similar to crocheting. This method takes way more time than usual rerouting due to the extra work you put into weaving, and unfortunately you only can do this if you have access to the inside of the head, 
but I think it looks really pretty and orderly and worth it if you make something like a wig, where the looks matter not only on the outside, but on the inside as well. It could be good to use some glue on the inside to fix the loops additionally though, but uh, I am going for a simple hairstyle today and I am not going to pull her hair strong enough to damage anything, so I kept it how it is, thinking that it will probably also be safer for the skull to keep the wig as soft as possible. When I was done with rerouting, I used boiling water to style her hair and make it lay smooth. I brushed most of her hair to the back, so it will cover the opening and hide the scalp properly, but I think it suits the doll round face shape pretty well as well. I protected her hair with some plastic wrap and now she's ready for face up. Just like I did with her body and skull, I prepare her face for repaint by cleaning it with alcohol and priming with Mr. Super Clear sealant. This time I've decided to give her more natural and modern makeup and make her skin tone look more lively and positive, which might sound odd for a ghost, but this face is not a part of her real look, it's just an illusion and represents more how she wants to be seen than reality. So I started changing her skin tone with pastels. First I applied a layer of light pinkish skin tone pastels and it turned out greyish. So I also applied a layer of slightly darker, more orange colored pastels to balance the blue shade her skin originally had. I sealed it and applied one more layer of pink and two layers of white pastels until I've got the skin color I desired. White pastels turn almost transparent and the darker colors become even darker after sealing, so it took me two layers of white to now balance that orange. Luckily I don't need to repaint the body as well. I did a little research on modern Japanese makeup trends for inspiration and I picked a couple of things I wanted to apply on my doll as well, like using shimmers on the eyelids and applying blush almost right under the eyes. Unlike in Korean makeup, in Japanese makeup tint is more likely to be applied all over the lips and not just to the middle, which is also an interesting and nice detail I liked and tried to make her lips look more like she is using tint. On one of the pictures I saw a girl wearing colored contact lenses that created a blue outline on her iris and I thought wow, probably my doll would also look great with a more unique eye color and I tried to make them transition from brown to light blue. That was not so easy, but I ended up happy with the result. Laguna Blue is one of my favorite Monster High face molds because of her cute round baby face and this is my second time working with her and could be my second favorite repaint after Rania who is also Laguna Blue by the way. What a coincidence! There are no accidents.
Face up is usually one of the first things I show in my videos, because to me it feels like it makes more sense to present the character creation in this order, like first there is body and face and then I slowly add more and more details, right? But in reality I do the face up last, when I have a better feel of what colors and elements will be used in her outfit. Fabrics and materials are usually more limited than paint and pastels, so it's always easier to fit makeup to the clothing and not the other way around. And for me it is very important to make all the elements complement each other, and to avoid the design being boring I would choose one or two accents and then slowly build up everything else around these accents. This time all of the choices I made were dictated by her long white hair and, spoilers, the fabric I chose for her kimono. So by now you might be able to guess that there is many pastel colors, metallics and strong pink accents going to be involved later on. To add shimmer to her eyeshadows I am going to use this iridescent acrylic paint in the color pearl white flesh. As I mentioned in one of my older videos, when I work with iridescent paint I choose the right shade not by color of the paint, but color of the glitter that's mixed in with them. Because these paints barely have any pigment in them and when it's dry you will pretty much end up with almost transparent paint and the color of the glitter will dominate. This particular paint has pink glitter in it and fits my goal perfectly. And in this project I also test a new medium I bought recently, it's metallic acrylic paint from Castle Arts. I fancied this brand during Black Friday's sale because of how cheap the supplies were comparing to other brands, but I was also surprised by how many different art supplies they had, so besides these metallic acrylics I also bought a big set of watercolor pencils, which I didn't even open yet, <laughs> and a set of paints for textile. So maybe in one of the upcoming videos I'll test these supplies as well, compare them to others and then see if they are any good and worth buying. In this project I only tested their metallic acrylic paints and truth be told I had pretty low expectations for them, again because of their low price and paints with metallic effects are normally a bit less pigmented than standard paint, but from what I saw I am actually really happy with the quality. I think it's on par with way more expensive brands I used in my projects before and what was the most important thing to me is that this paint doesn't leave a sticky finish like some other paint does. I think I'll test it a bit more and give my final opinion a bit later, but it looks so promising. She will be wearing traditional clothing, so it's another good chance for me to reuse my kimono pattern I made for Nakime. The outfit will consist of two layers and for the first kimono I'll only increase the length or should I call it the width or even depth <laughs> of the sleeves and then do everything else just the same as I did for Nakima. I love sewing kimonos so much, because all of the parts are pretty simple, seams are straight and it's easy to sew them with a the machine. And comparing to Nakima's kimono, for this one I used only viscose and cotton fabrics, which are easy to iron and I don't need to shape anything additionally with hand stitches. Everything stays flat from just ironing. The first layer is done, but the second layer is going to be tricky. <laughs> Here comes the fabric that basically defined everything for this project. It's another fabric I got that was made in Japan and has traditional print on it. And I have no words to describe how beautiful this pattern is. 
the color palette, golden accents, all of the motifs traditional for Japan like pine, k k chrysanthemum. The national flower of Japan is chrysanthemum. Peony flower cut or hanagurumma, cherry and plum blossoms, temari balls, and the magic hammer of Daikoko, one of the seven lucky gods, a magic artifact that is able to make any wish of the beholder come true bamboo and many other plants but the most important to me it had peonies because the legend i was inspired by is about a peony lantern this fabric is so so beautiful and i'm going to use it for making another type of kimono called hikizuri or trailing skirt it's a very festive type of kimono that in the past was worn by wealthy women and nowadays by maiko and traditional dancers of Nihon Buyo. This type of kimono usually has colorful padding that also protects the trailing skirt from wearing down. I think this dark pink fabric makes a nice accent without bringing too much attention to it, so I chose this one for padding. And then I needed to adjust my pattern again, because the outer clothing needs to be slightly wider, especially if it has padding. And I also slightly increased the neck hole to make sure the lower collar won't be covered completely and we will be able to see other layers. I increased the length and added some extra material at the bottom, which I believe will help the skirt lay smoother. Of course, traditionally all kimonos are just rectangular, but when you work with dolls you need to cheat your way sometimes because of their small scale. I've spent like an hour just trying to find the best way to place the pattern on fabric so that placement of the print on the finished kimono would make the most sense. And I think I nailed it. This kimono will have a padding and I set myself a goal to build it that way so that not a single seam allowance would stay open, just like in human clothing. That was challenging and time consuming, but also a really fun challenge. And the joy of working with such a beautiful fabric, just looking at it and holding it in my hands, it's just priceless. I've never felt so motivated to go to work and look at this quality. It's not even fraying. Guys, I wish you could all find a person who would appreciate you as much as I appreciate this fabric. Just look at it. It's so good. I, I can't.
And of course, every kimono needs an obi. I had the choice of several colors for the obi, like white, deep red, light blue, because all these colors would fit, but I ended up making a pink obi with the same padding I used on the kimono, because I didn't want it to take any attention away from everything else. I still wanted it to be detailed, but in more subtle way, and turn it into a bridge between the two main elements, kimono and hair. So I took pink shades from the kimono and combined them with white and silver that represents her hair. I like how the bow and the sleeves look together from the back, it's like the sleeves are an extension of the bow, so interesting. <laughs> And the last accessory for today is her lantern. I saw several ways of how the lantern was depicted and of course I chose the most complex one. I made a blueprint to better understand the form of the lantern and did some math to figure out the size of the side walls and found out that the rectangles on the sides are exactly the same as the top and bottom ones. And apparently it was obvious from just looking at the blueprint and all of these extra steps were not needed. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> so I figured that for the frame I need 32 long sticks and 16 short ones. In the legend of the Peony Lantern, all of the action is happening during Obon, the holiday dedicated to ancestors, family and loved ones who passed away. Buddhists believe that during Obon their spirits are returning to earth and visit their family. And on the first day people would go visit the graves of their relatives with a lantern that's supposed to show the spirits the way back home. And on the third day of Obon show the way back to the grave. In the original legend, on the third day of Obon, Hone Ono led the man to her grave where he also died, but the expression on his face was happy and peaceful, because he could finally reunite with the woman he loved. That's why people say that the story tells of love beyond death and a strong spiritual connection between people. I'm not crying, you're crying.
The next step after building and painting the frame would be adding paper walls. A long time ago a friend of mine presented me these envelopes made of washi paper and I kept them as a memory, but probably it would be better to give them another life in my art than just keep them in a box, right? I also decided to make some tiny peonies made of gathered ribbon and place them on the corners. I took a tiny string of lights and rolled it in a ball to light the lantern. It has a pretty small and lightweight switch, so I'll be able to easily hide it in her sleeves. And now it is time to see the end result. I am so happy with how she turned out. Even though Peony Lantern is a summer tale, all of these soft pastel colors and flower motifs have a spring feel to it. She certainly is one of the best dolls I've made so far and what do you think? Do you like this repaint? Let's discuss it in the comments section. And if you do, please support this video with your likes because your single click will help my channel grow, help me afford all of the great supplies for my art and simply motivate me to create more videos like this. Your positive response to my previous video helped me realize how interested you all are in this topic, so I decided to make it a series of dolls and for your comfort I created a playlist called Night Parade of 100 Demons, where I will gather all of my future yokai videos. If you like, you can also support my channel further by buying me a coffee, all of the links you can find in the description box. For every 100 coffees I reach, I'll make a giveaway and the winner will get a custom doll commission. 
each coffee equals one entry. Thank you very much for spending your time with me and I hope to see you soon in my next video. Bye!